Welcome to the Hyper Fast Show. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen in the audience and the millions around the world who wish they were here, today we have a special live edition of the Hyper Fast Agent Podcast. Your co-hosts, Billion Dollar Agents Dan Lesniak and Kerry Scholl are interviewing Million Dollar Listing New York star and Billion Dollar Agent Ryan Serhan. And now, let's get ready to learn Hyper Fast. <laughs> that was awesome. That's a talent right there. All right, thanks for listening to us. Thanks for being here, audience members. We've got a special show today. We are here with the one and only Ryan Serhant. Welcome, Ryan. Thank you for having me. Yeah, you just Thank you for that insane intro. <laughs> that was crazy. You just gave an amazing keynote address to, to all the members here at the Hyperfast Agent Summit. And the VIP lunch was amazing. And one question that was asked there that I want to ask again here, because I think everyone here can benefit from hearing it, is what's your biggest piece of advice for a real estate agent starting out? Uh, my biggest piece of advice, if you're a brand new real estate agent, is don't do it by yourself. Um, is to work on the team, right? That's what I didn't do. And if I could go back in time and do it again, I wouldn't sit there by myself taking photos of listings in Chicago and putting them on Craigslist as listings in New York City. Because right? that was the training I had in New York. Like, wasn't, I, I didn't do that on my own. Um, and yeah, I would work on a team. I learned from somebody. I would learn, you know. And what I tell people all the time is like, because people get into this business, and we talked about this at the lunch a little bit too, that you know, they think they're going to make a lot of money the first year, and if they don't, they quit. So, like in New York City, the, the, the rate of people that quit the real estate business is like 75% of the real estate agents who get into the business and they quit in that first year. It's really, really high because New York is really expensive. Um, so it's hard to live there and do real estate at the same time. Um, and you have to treat those first at least two, if not three years, as your grad school. You don't have to go to grad school, but you treat those first couple years as grad school. If you know anyone that's in law school, med school, business school, any other type of higher education, they make no money. They make no money, they're just learning all the time. That's all they're doing is just learning, learning, learning. That's what your first couple years in the real estate business is all about. Just focus on learning, absorbing as much information as possible. And if you happen to make a little bit of money at the same time, because you're doing some open houses and getting a little bit of peace here and a little bit there, and maybe getting some of your few own clients, awesome, great. It's all bonus on top of just learning and absorbing as much information as you can. Amazing. When we did the podcast with you earlier this year, you talked about practice, and I know that this goes along with learning. But if you were trying to help the audience up their skills, yeah. what kind of practice should they be doing and how should they figure out what to practice? Um, I mean, I am a very, very strong believer in improv classes, right? I think everybody should take an improv class. I know we've talked about that before. Um, it's super uncomfortable and really weird. And you should do it if you haven't done it before. Because remember, like what, what I just talked about that whole time, right? Like I, my ability to sell it comes from my ability to talk to strangers. Like, how do I get on the phone and talk to an agent I've never met before and convince them to get their client to come down in price when they don't know me? Right? How do I get on the phone and talk to a buyer who doesn't know me? How do I talk to a seller in their house who I've never met before and actually have that be an organic, authentic conversation where I don't sound like a salesperson reading a script? Um, and improv classes teach you that. And you don't have to go by yourself. Go with a friend, your spouse, someone you work with, right? And you'll learn how to be a dog on fire on Mars. Like, <laughs> you'll learn how to do really, really weird things and you'll be okay with it. And then all of a sudden you'll realize, wait a minute, this isn't so bad, putting myself out there. This isn't like embarrassing because everyone's doing the same thing. I promise you, it changes the way you're gonna talk to people literally the next day. Everything else, you know, you can learn, right? From books, from you guys, you know, from doing all the things that you do, which is just insane. Um, and, you know, all that stuff you can learn. But I think if there's anything anyone's going to do, like tomorrow, I'd say go take an improv class. You might not think it's going to make a big difference, but like future you will look back on it and you'll realize that you did more business and you're not going to understand why. And I guarantee it'll be because you know how to talk to people better. I love that answer. How many of you are going to do it and listen to him? Say yes. yes. All right. Wow. Awesome. Wow, you have a power over people. <laughs> I do that I just in rooms. I wanted to cement the lesson, I do right? that in rooms and know everyone's like, man, I don't know, Ryan, I'm gonna do that. That sounds weird. 
I'll think about You're it. You're like, who's doing that tomorrow, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen? Everyone's like, me, I'll do it, don't hurt me. <laughs> Was there a moment that, that you can think back of where you realized in that moment, like, wow, I'm really gonna get up that hockey stick curve or exponential growth is, is right here. And, and what was it like before then getting to that moment? Oh man, it's, it's all in hindsight. Like there was no aha moment for me. There was no moment where I was like, wow, wow, things are getting a little bit crazy. Um, I guess when I kind of got the team up to 10 people and I was still getting new people to come onto the team. That's kind of when I was like, okay, something's happening here. And I think we're gonna have to really figure this out. And I need more office space and I'm gonna have to figure out how to grow. And I'm gonna have to figure out how to get all these people business. Because for me, the team isn't just about them doing their own business. It's also, they're there to help me with my business. Yeah. Um, they all work on my listings, they work with my buyers, and they also do their own things. Um, and so that was kind of a moment where I was like, okay, crazy, I can actually get enough business where I can have 10 other people make a pretty good living. Um, and leading up to that point, there just wasn't enough business, you know, which is a whole nother conversation. People ask me all the time, they're like, hey, I wanna make more money next year, so I'm gonna start a team. I'm like, well, that's <laughs> stupid. Like, y more people only means more problems, right? If there's no business for those people, if there's nothing for them to do, hiring a team or getting a business partner that does just as little business as you do will do nothing but create more problems. At that point, you're better off being on someone else's team to learn and do more business, right? Or to work with different partnerships in your office or with other real estate agents that are out there. That's kind of like what I did when I first started. I team up with different people depending on the deal, depending on what language they spoke. You know, that's kind of like, that's how I did it. But if you have enough business where you cannot be in enough places at one time, where you have too many open houses on a Sunday and you don't know what to do, that's when you bring on the first person, right? And if you wanna get into a higher price point, that's how you bring on the first person. So you don't lose the current business that you have at, you know, if you're selling $300,000 houses, you don't lose those people. And if you wanna get into the $500,000 price point, you gotta focus a lot. You gotta go and meet those people where they hang out, go to the restaurants they hang out at, try to find people who have $500,000 friends, who have $500,000 problems, go to where they go to the doctor, Go figure out who those people are, who those buyers and sellers are, and actually go and meet them. But you'll have somebody underneath you who's dealing with the $200,000 to $300,000 business that you do all the time. You'll quarterback each deal. You'll start it. You might go to the pitch. You might go on the first appointment, and then you'll close it. But the rest of your day is open to you focusing on getting into a higher price point. So both of those ways are the ways that I, I built teams. Um, and I don't know if that answers your question. Perfect. Okay, great. <laughs> I have one thing to say. Sure. More people doesn't necessarily mean more problems. It's just different problems. Sure. So it's like higher level problems, right? So your example is perfect because if it's a $200,000, $300,000 price point and you're trying to evolve, can you tell I love my team? I'm like, they're not problems, Ryan. They're amazing. They reduce the problems and let me handle different things. So sure. don't be discouraged to get a team. I think the most important piece of what you said is don't get a team to get more money if that's yes. not your sole desire. It's doing right? things for the right reason. Exactly. Yeah. That's it's exactly growing for right. the right reason. It's also, you know, it's also people who focus a lot of time on, we talked about this at lunch too, but setting up office, right? They set up office. They really care about their business cards and their email and like <laughs> they set up their office and their CRM and their Excel sheets and like they, and they really, the only reason they care so much about that stuff is because they're too nervous about actually doing the work and doing yes, business. Yes, totally. So it makes them feel better to be busy. Yes. Right? Those, are, those are people, you know, that's, those are procrastinators. And so they, they're busy, 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 but then they get nothing done. And then those are the people you meet, the real estate agents who are frazzled all the time, who are just like, oh my God, I'm so, I had a crazy year, so busy, the weekend was so crazy, crazy, crazy. They've sold three things, right? But they're super busy, 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 because they, that's what makes them feel good. They'll complain about it all day long, but it makes them feel good because it feels like they're doing something and doing the real work, which is going out to meet new people who could be buyers or sellers, freaks them out, so they just don't do it. <laughs> because they didn't have time, they were too busy Being doing busy. their business cards. Yeah. <laughs> Too busy being busy. I'm sure none of you know anyone like that. Okay, should we open it up to the audience and let them ask some questions, Dan? Do we have our mic runners? You guys ready to be sprinters right now? 
because we want to get in a lot of questions. Brian from Colorado Springs. Woohoo! Wait, 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 wait. Bike runners. Really quick. Let's go, we blue need like shirts. Four of you ready to go. Do we have the box? Where are the boxes? Like box. Hey, sir, Brian Rodriguez, Colorado Springs. Thanks again for your time. Sure. Uh, I love your one strike policy. As a military background, like there's no excuse. And so it leads into more accountability. So if you have such a high expectation, especially with follow through, do you or someone in your organization keeps that accountability to avoid that? that one strike policy? No, um, I tried for a little bit, right? It's a fine line for me. Like real estate is also really hard. And I have moments where I'm a disciplinarian and then people will quit because it's just too hard, right? And they'll quit because they don't wanna be fired. So you gotta be careful that way too. Um, so it's a balance between teaching through discipline and leading by example while also creating a fun enough and happy enough work environment where people can do what they need to do and are okay to mess up here and there. Um, and most of the times when they mess up, I don't find out about it and I don't know about it because they fix it already. Um, it's the times where I find out about it and most of the time it's because, because they didn't do something, that person then calls me. And they're like, hey, um, you know, Bob said that he was gonna send me those things or get back to me on Monday. I, I know Bob works with you. Just wondering if you guys are still interested in having me as a client. So when that happens, then it has now made it to me and that's not good. And sometimes there's an explanation for it, right? So it's like, I don't just like decapitate people. Um, <laughs> that's good. Yeah, but oftentimes like there isn't an explanation and it's like, oh shit, I forgot. Which like at the end of the day is fine. Dude, there's, there's so many other places you could work and do real estate. There's so many other places you could sell. There's so many other jobs you can have. You just can't do it for me because uh, my reputation is the only thing I have, like above all else. You know, my reputation is my brand. And if one person out there thinks that I have people on my team who forget about them, like that's a, that's a, that, it's a ripple effect. Then that person's gonna tell three people. Then that person's gonna tell, I and mean, it's just like, it's not the end of the world, but for me, like it kind of, it kind of is. You know, life is short. Great. Hello, oh, hello. His wife. <laughs> yes. Question. So, Ryan, you're very, very busy. You have a couple expansion teams: one in Miami, one in LA. Correct. Yeah. Um, you travel a lot. How do you keep up with the culture of your team and make sure the culture is up your standard when you're not present? Oh God. <laughs> with all the hard questions from Colorado today. Um, <laughs> That's probably a question better answered by the team. It's really hard. Um, it's really, really hard uh, because the culture is strong and things are great, and I know they are when I'm there. I think it's harder when I'm not there. Um, but I try to make it as entrepreneurial as possible, right? I try to make it as exciting as possible where I literally just do my best to lead by example. If I show up at 10 a.m. every day with a bagel, then like, I can't be mad when other people show up at 10.30 or 11 with two bagels. You know, like I can't get mad at people for not doing what I set myself out to do. So if I'm there early, then sure, I can be upset when someone doesn't come in until 11 o'clock and because they slept in. I'm like, all right, that's just not how it works here. Um, so it's about setting the right expectations, but also just really, 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 really leading by example. Like that's, that's the best piece of advice I can give. Um, and I try to make it fun, I think. I don't know, you have to ask them. I bet if you audited my whole team right now, they'd be like, it's hell to work here. Uh, it's terrible, he's so mean. <laughs> to Alana's point, what is uh, a strategy you fan found with managing your team as you're afar? Mm, I have good people, like it's just good people, right? I have, um, I have two assistants. Um, one is an executive assistant, one's a director of operations. I have two graphic designers. I have a head of new development. I have the entire media team that's in the office and engaged with everybody. So people that are there that know what to do. And then I have agents who really, really take initiative and are kind of like the go-to for questions and things in the office. And they're the ones that also kind of like set, set, the, like set the record straight during the day. Like the other agents see those agents doing well and they then want to be like that. So it's not just me, because I understand that looking at me might be tough and people are going to say, oh, well, yeah, but he is this. And so I'm not going to be that. But if other agents on the team were selling 
cars or furniture or rugs two years ago and are now doing 10 to 20 million dollars a year, like, so can you. Um, and just lead by example from that. So those people kind of control the culture for me. Awesome. It's a question all the way back there. Check. It's on. Okay. Yeah, you, uh, you talked about uh, your first deal with Hazel Kim and had a very entertaining story. And then you also okay. talked about Don't, having... Do you know her? No, Don't no. tell her I told that story. <laughs> it was a great story, though. <laughs> <laughs> but she you also so talked angry. about, you know, early on when you only had a team of 10 and sort of at the beginning. But if I wanted to, I'd like you to go back to even further when you got your first person and how that went and sort of how you overcame the fear of, like you said, you have very high standards for yourself and how you overcame the fear of like trusting that person to keep your reputation yeah. intact. Yeah, sure. Um, really, really hard lesson to learn and I learned it the hard way multiple times. Um, and what I learned at the beginning was like, kind of like what we just talked about, you know, I would get angry at people because I'd assume they'd know what I was thinking. Right? I'd be like, oh, how did you not know to do that that way? Maybe it wasn't common sense for everybody. So as long as I train people the way I want, you know, and teach them and have like guides and have things written out and have everything out there, um, like they, then I don't have to explain it twice, right? They'll learn, um, but like I have to at least do the training and set the expectations and be a clean and honest communicator from the get go. Um, and the first person I ever brought on was Yolanda. She was in 2009. She's been with me to this day, right? She speaks Mandarin. Um, and she was uh, an intern at the time and now basically runs my entire office and has never had another job. And so that was, for me, the first thing that I wanted to do by bringing other people on was just not to have another agent, um, but to have somebody who could do all the work, right? To do all like, the busy work, the job work, between emails, scheduling appointments, for us, we have to do a lot of applications in the city, board packages between the condos, the co-ops, the inspections, like all that stuff is a whole job in and itself, even if you just have one or two deals. So I brought her in to help with that stuff, to free up my time, because I only have so much time during the day, to focus and only go out and get new business. And then we hold each other accountable for it. Like She does all that stuff, a lot of it, which is not enjoyable work to do, there's a lot of like office work, but she knows that while she's doing it, I'm out hustling my ass off and meeting new people to bring in more business to quarterback more deals. Um, and then the first new agent I brought on was someone to do rentals. His name was Bill Dosher. Um, he had really cool hair <laughs> and he was brand new um, and I wanted to get into sales and I just had rental business. I didn't want to lose the rental business because that's kind of how I was paying you know, rent in the beginning this before Hazel Kim. Um, and I had Bill come in and help me do the rental business so that my focus all day long was just gonna be on building my sale business while Bill would run around with rental clients and Yolanda would do all the busy work, right? So then my job was literally just to be my own finder. Like if you read the book, I talk about finder, keeper, doer, if you take the course, um, like to be my own finder all day long, just going out and looking for business. That's it. That's, that's how that went. <laughs> Thanks. What else? Blinded by um, the light. Blinded by the light. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Um, great presentation. Thank you. Of course. Um, I wanted to ask, what is your um, opinion on the importance of marketing automation and how much time that's saving you and data analytics and how that's narrowing your um, leads that you choose to follow up with and that you invest your time in following up with those leads. I kind of wanted to hear if you guys are implementing data analytics and marketing automation to filter those leads. Those yeah, leads. sure. Uh, if, sort of. Uh, a lot of the business we do isn't cold lead business, right? We do some of it. Um, we do a lot of, I mean, we do a good amount of marketing automation, okay, but there's still manual labor that goes into it, depending on whether it's like direct mail or advertising or newsletters, right? There's people that do that stuff, but it doesn't take a whole lot of brain power from me. Um, but we do a lot of manual marketing as well to people. Like at the end of the day, people know bullshit marketing when they see it. So like you got to reach out personally and have your team reach out personally and cater your newsletters and cater your emails and cater your text conversations. Like I just signed up to this thing called community. Um, 
it, where it's mass, where it's texting. So instead of being able to send out an email to everybody I know or post to something on Instagram, I now have a phone number, six four. what's my phone number? 646-480-2528, I think that's what it is. I've been posting about it on Instagram the last few days. Is that what it is? Oh, are you in it? <laughs> what's up? See, I got one. Uh, there you go, two. Two, all right. So, like, well, my goal with that is that, you know, it's not, it's not for spam, you know. Um, it's that in the next couple months, next couple years, instead of having just an email database of hundreds of thousands of people where then it gets filtered to spam, with one text message, I could let everybody who signed up anyway know, and sign up for free, um, know that, hey, I got a new listing coming out, or my new book is coming out, or this is happening, or that's happening, or, and it, you can cater it out also by area, by zip code, like where people live, it's totally crazy. So we're doing stuff like that, but also mixing it as part of the brand. Like I don't do marketing just for the sake of marketing, and I don't do brand stuff just for the sake of the brand. Everything has to come full circle. Um, so like the book is full circle for me for business. The TV shows are full circle for me. The vlog isn't just because I enjoy YouTube. Like the vlog is full circle for business. Um, and then the follow-up that we do with everybody, we do, have a, we do have a group of people that do our ads for us. Um, and a lot of that follow-up comes through swipe ups um, and through retargeted emails that we do. And that's a whole separate conversation that we could talk about. Um, and it's a business. And we do a lot of that with the course, actually. Um, and I, to anyone who wants to know, and Kyle will kill me if I don't tell everybody. Um, so we, we have a course that we put out uh, and you can go to it. It's ryansterhant.com slash hyperfast um, and you'll get it for 10% off because I love you. Yeah. So, yeah, so now you know. I almost forgot to tell you that. Yeah, we set that up. What else? Back there, in the back. Oh, there you go. Never mind. You right there. Hi. Uh you're a great inspiration. I follow your blog. Um, is there anybody who inspires you? And what gets you up in the morning? What's your biggest motivation? Thank you. You, you inspire me. <laughs> <laughs> you inspire me. Dude, I, honestly, like, I'm inspired by the real estate agent community. And it's, it's not crap. Like, this is such a hard job. We're all totally insane people. We work for free. Okay? Everyone else can say, oh, I don't like real estate agents and they can give us shit all day long. We work for free. I work for free until someone else, and not just one person, multiple other people have to make the same exact decision that is massively financial. And I have to work for free up until that moment happens. And a thousand other things come and break that decision up. Like, it's, it's crazy. There's no benefits, there's no salary. There's no, there's no nothing. Everybody else gets to have jobs and get paid by the hour and get bonuses and have lives. We wake up every day to deal with other people's emotions and we do it for fucking free. <laughs> I, it's absolutely nuts. And I think that's what's super cool about us doing this together. Like we're all in this business together. That's why I love doing these types of things because you're all in this room together. You're all here to learn more. You didn't all come here because like, you really like the Marriott, right? <laughs> you came here because you, you want to learn more. You want to do better. You want to do it together. And you're going to do business with everybody else in this room if you do your job. Um, and that's, like, that's what inspires me every day. And that's why we did the course and, and wrote the book and have the other ones and all that. Um, and then what wakes me up every morning is definitely the baby. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, well, my alarm, I actually beat the baby. Uh, I wake up before the baby and she wakes up just a tad after and I go get her and she stands up in her crib now because she figured out how to do that and she is pissed off. Um, <laughs> she is angry as shit. She is mostly Greek. The American that I put into her is like the smiley kind that shows up at 10 a.m. Everything else is the Greek wife. Um, and she's angry and I hold her, but it's the best part because that's when she's so tired, she doesn't understand, so she puts her head on my shoulder. Aww. She is the least cuddly baby I've ever met. I thought girls are supposed to be like cuddly and lovey. No, like she's on crack. She is <laughs> wired all day long, wants nothing to do with anybody else. She's got her plans, she's got places to go. Um, but in the morning she wakes up and then I give her to Amelia and she eats and then she passes out. That's How old is she? Up. Eight months. Eight months. Grayson yeah. turned in seven months. Crazy, today. crazy, crazy, amazing, yeah. congratulations. I love that perspective on working for free until multiple other people agree on something. And it really is, you need the buyer, the you know, the yeah. seller, the lender, 
condo boards, like all sorts of other parties, and then at any point, you're yeah, dude. I never and thought of it that way. Yeah, man. Like doctors get paid whether you die or live. <laughs> <laughs> like, have you ever thought about that? Like, they're gonna do their best, but if you die, like, they're still paying their mortgage. Okay? <laughs> if my client dies, they're not <laughs> closing. <laughs> So like you better live, okay? You better live. Like I swear to God, I will resuscitate one of my clients way better than any ER doctor ever. Cause the ER doctor's like, this is my 11th client. For me, I'm like, live, Bob. Let's go. <laughs> so like we do. We work for free, you know. And I tell oh. everybody that. Like we work for. That's why I have a book that I give out to everybody. Um, like I, I have like my pitch book, but I make it really, really nice, and I send it to people before I meet them. Uh, we talk about it, I talk about it a lot, but it's in a black box and it's got this beautiful book inside. So if I meet somebody like on the street or wherever and I'm gonna go meet them at their apartments, I'll quickly messenger it to their door, well Jordan will do it, and inside it'll say, hey Jim, so great talking to you outside Starbucks two seconds ago, really looking forward to seeing you at 5 p.m. They get home, they see that and they're like, what is this witchery magic? Crazy, what is this book? First impression, seal. Um, and so, like, but in that book, when you open it up, the first thing that it says is, we don't declare success until you declare success. Like, football players could have the worst season ever, lose all their games, get injured, not even play, still get paid. Maybe they'll get paid more if they do better, but that's life, right? We get zero dollars. We actually go into debt, negative money, right? And we still have to pay tax, and we don't get to declare success until our clients declare success. And they control everything. So people should give us a little more credit. Mm -hmm. Woo! Yeah. All right, we have time for one more question. I see people pointing. Harry. There were a couple more. I got Back you. there in the Way back. in the back. Go ahead. So what tips could you give us when you want to blend a business piece with a long-term friendship piece? Like how to work with friends, is that the question? <laughs> long-term friends, you mean? Long-term friends. I have a lot of long-term friends. Lucky you. Um, <laughs> uh, I, listen, it's, it's setting expectations, right? It's the same thing. It's communication, setting expectations. The number one thing you can do in that situation, and with anybody, is from the get-go, uh, and I tell this to everybody who comes up to me and says, I don't know how to close, I can't close. It's because you try to close at the end. Like, you don't close at the end, you set it up from the beginning. You know, so same thing with friends. Anything that could go wrong, tell them what it is from the beginning. Let them know what the market's going on right now. Let them know that they're going to get outbid on 50 houses. Let them know that they might not get approved for their loan. Let them know that we could have an inspection and the house could burn down. Like, let them know everything. That way, you've set it all up from the beginning. Anything that happens that's not that is pretty good. Like, you do the same thing for, I mentioned it, but home inspections. Like, every home inspection we do, I sit with the clients and I explain to them, the home inspector's job is to find problems with this house. You are paying them to find problems. If they find problems, all it means is that they did their job. If the problems are really, really bad, screw it, you don't need this house. But if there are problems in general, that's what houses have. We'll get the seller to take care of it, we'll figure it out, don't worry about it, it's their job. You don't have that conversation, if you don't do it, inspection report comes back and there are problems, deal over. I thought I was buying a brand new house. I had no idea that the floors were tilted to 0.1 degree towards Jupiter. Like, <laughs> I can't buy this house now. Mercury's in retrograde. The inspector told me so. Like, no, all right? You set those expectations up from the beginning. You do it with friends, loved ones, family, everything. Because what people typically do with friends is you don't have difficult conversations because you just want to keep it friendly. Everything's cool. Let's go see houses. Everything's awesome. And then things are weird, and then it doesn't sell. Then they don't get the house they want, then you don't know what to do, and then it's awkward. Worst case scenario, set it up at the beginning, just like a prenup, right? It's like if you're going to a bar, sit down with someone. If you like them, tell them everything bad about yourself first. <laughs> don't do that. Great strategy there. Don't do that. Don't do that. What else? I saw one more hand. One more. Well, you already asked so many questions. There's the green shirt right no, there. No, Lana, no.
He's going. You're almost there. <laughs> okay, two more, real quick. You and then green shirt, and then we'll be good. Real quick question for you. Yeah. Um, how did you manage to get Times Square closed off completely? Um, Money. Yeah. Uh, it took six months of planning. If you don't know, I, I proposed to my wife by shutting down Times Square for an hour, um, which had only ever been done before that in that movie Vanilla Sky with Tom Cruise. Um, and so it took me six months. I had to go through like 16 different agencies between the FDNY, the NYPD, the MTA, the Department of Buildings, the Department of Transportation, uh, like literally everybody, um, you know, and like a quarter million dollars. Yeah. So Ryan, I liked you before and now I really like you. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. You're making this all look bad, right? <laughs> Listen, for me, like, ah, dude, life is short. Like, the wedding, I knew was going to be her decision. Like, I wasn't going to plan the wedding. You know, she, I, I, I filmed it. I put her into that whole insanity, and so she, she still hates me to this day because I made her do that. But, like, we, <clears throat> I knew that it was going to be in Greece, and it was going to be her thing. But the proposal was my thing. Like, I got to propose to her, and I could either make it the greatest proposal in the history of the world, or I could just do it regularly, you know? And that's, do I seem like a guy that does anything regularly? No. <laughs> no. So, you know, so I called up a bunch of people. I was like, I want to shut down Times Square for an hour. And they all said no for a long time. I was like, what's it going to cost? And it was, it was literally mostly like paying cops and paying time and paying the fire department and like permits. Everyone needed a permit for the same exact spot. It's like obscene. It's crazy. Apparently, it's a really high traffic space. Um, <laughs> so there's like... There's a lot of things. And then once so I was in it, right? Then like four months into it, then I couldn't quit. You know, it's like you're in a renovation. You're like, fuck it, rip out the bathroom. I'll just pay for it now. Like, that's literally what it was. And then she had a mental breakdown when we showed up. It was complete insanity. Uh, How? For one hour. Shut it down for one hour. It was like five months of lies to her to set her up for that day. Um, the whole family was like in on it. Everyone was like really distraught because everyone was like, we can't do it. This is insane. She thought we were going to Boston because I had to get her to get up early to drive in the car. Like why else would she do that? It was like this whole thing. Other people had to be involved in it. And then we pulled over and then she was in such a bad mood. She's like, what, you want me to get you coffee? <laughs> <laughs> and she looked up, saw where we were, saw there was no people and then saw a camera and immediately started crying. And she was like, what are you doing? Why are you doing this to me? Oh. <laughs> if you watch like the raw footage, they had to cut a lot out because it took me like six minutes to get her out of the car. Where she was like, why are you doing this to me? What are you doing? Why are you doing this to me? Why are you doing this to me? <laughs> and then I had like the orchestra that was there and the NASDAQ sign lit up, that whole thing. You know, so like she'll be my only wife for the rest of my life. <laughs> because the second wife, like, I can't, I tell her that too. I'm like, you know you're my first, second, and third wife, right? I cannot afford another one. Because now I've already set the bar, and the second wife's going to be like, really? No Times Square shut down? Like, <laughs> like, I can't do it again. I'd have to, what am I going to do? It's like, I'm screwed now. I totally, ugh, terrible. Set the bar for myself. That was an awesome question, and I love that. Yeah. Amazing. But last question. Okay, here. last, last one. Okay, hey, Ryan, thanks hey. for being here. Hey, I had a, uh, by the way, your family is very precious. Oh, thank you. All are a very cute, attractive family. Um, my question is, I'm a brand new real estate agent, nice. and I'm worried that I don't have a mentor. Did you have a mentor when you got started? And uh, last question is, do you want to be my mentor? <laughs> <laughs> sure. RyanSirhan.com slash hyperfast, 10%. <laughs> <laughs> There's a mentorship program in there, um, uh, and it's awesome. Uh, no, I didn't have a mentor. I, I, I wish I did. If I could go back in time, I would, without knowing what I know now, then sure, I would probably want to have one to tell me what to do. But then also in hindsight, like a, a lot of what I learned, you had to learn the hard way. You know, it's kind of like with the baby now, like she's, I want to pick her up every single time she falls over, and I want her to not touch that and not do this, and I want to say yes to everything she wants to do and do all that, but I, I have to learn that like, she has to learn too, and she's not going to learn how to walk if she doesn't fall over a couple times, you know, if she doesn't cry. And 
you know, a lot of my beginning of my career was like a significant amount of crying and a lot of like <laughs> talking to my mom. Like if you've read the book, like I put all of the terribleness in my life I put in there. Um, like clients yelling at me on the street. I had a girl scream at me on the street in the West Village and tell me I should not be in real estate ever. I'm not even a human professional. Um, oh. And marched off and then called her mom. And like I quickly went the other way and then called my mom and was like, <laughs> I hate New York City. Real estate sucks. People are the worst. I've had like grandmothers lie to me to save $5. Okay? So, but a lot of that toughened me up and made me into the real estate agent that I am today. Um, but yes, I'm happy to help you. Yeah. And everybody here, RyanSaranta.com slash hyperfast. You go there now. <laughs> also, you guys are amazing. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Back to New York. Cool? Thanks, man. Thanks guys, give me. it up one more time for Ryan Serhant. Oh, sure. And if you guys are listening to the podcast, give us a quick like and uh, subscribe. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, please give us a thumbs up, hit that like button, leave us some comments. We want to know your feedback and share this with someone that you think could benefit as well. And if you want to see more great videos, click this playlist up here or better yet, click right here to subscribe and turn on post notifications so you don't miss any of our updates.